Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. Today, Gigi Robinson tells her story. Now, Gigi is a Gen Z content creator, mental health and chronic illness speaker and advocate. Now, she didn't set out to do any of this. As a talented kid, she attended the legendary New York City Performing Arts School, LaGuardia High School. But as we all know, sometimes life gets in the way. We're going to talk about her personal journey working to overcome health struggles and how she uses social media for good. Hi. Hi to you. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. And uh, I want to kind of start by talking about my childhood because when I was a little kid, I was diagnosed with a chocolate allergy. So, mm. and I don't, I, I don't remember how it happened, but I got so ill that I was hospitalized. Wow. And I remember as a chubby little kid without chalk, I'm like, oh my God, my life is over. Obviously it wasn't. And then fast forward like 10, 15 years, once I got it through puberty, I could eat chocolate, I was fine. But mm. recently- my three-year-old nephew was diagnosed as having celiac. And I'm like, oh my God, this little kid's life is changed forever. I was lucky. I dodged a bullet. I, you know, chocolate allergy, I could, I could, I could have dealt with it, but then obviously I grew out of it. Celiac, as we all know, it's it's kind of with you with for life. Um, so talk to me about your introduction to chronic illness. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. And what an interesting allergy. I've never heard of someone with a chocolate allergy. So that's cool. Um, but I'm glad that you can eat chocolate now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was diagnosed with a genetic disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome hypermobility when I was about 11 years old. It came after a series of back-to-back -back injuries that took months to heal. And uh, growing up in New York City, luckily, and having a mom working in the healthcare space, I was able to get amazing treatment at the hospital for special surgery, uh, New York Presbyterian, NYU. And they figured out very, very early on that most likely I was having symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that basically, if you think about like a hair tie or a rubber band, it's like the rubber band lost all of its elasticity and it's just super, super loose and it doesn't bounce back. So that's how my muscles and ligaments kind of act. And that also causes hypermobility, which can cause instability in the joints, and it can cause like the joints to kind of move out of place and whatnot. So that was my first unfortunate uh, chronic illness. The other was this mysterious stomach issue that literally was undiagnosable. They didn't know what it was. My test would come back normal. They just were like, you might just have like a weird stomach that hurts. And two years ago, again, I'm 25 now. So when I was 23 years old, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. And I most likely had that all throughout my teenage years. And that was causing me extreme inflammation, fatigue, and chronic pain. So uh, I'm, I'm thankfully feeling like I'm somewhat seeing light at the end of the tunnel with my chronic health issues. But it was definitely really hard growing up. Well, it's funny. You saw both sides of it. The first side of it being, oh, you were diagnosed relatively quickly with folks yeah. who may listen to this, who, who have people with who chronic illness or they're themselves, sometimes trying to find out what the hell it is, is the hard part. And then the, unfortunately, the second time around, it took a little longer. Uh, why do you think that second time took a little longer to, to finally get to the root cause? Because I know endometriosis, it's one of those things where it's kind of one of those I, I hate to say like the dark secrets of women. It's one of those things that a lot of women suffer in silence mm -hmm. with. So mm -hmm. why do you think it took so long for you? So one in 10 women have endometriosis, which is a huge percentage yeah. of that. But if you look at how much money goes to endometriosis research, it is minuscule compared to so many other things like cancer and diabetes, which, you know, those should also have a, a large research budget. Absolutely. But I think for something that one in 10 women deal with, there should be a lot more research on it. Yeah. The other issue was we were looking in the wrong places. We weren't, my doctors were not asking me if my pain was cyclical. They weren't asking me if my pain was worse during my cycles. They weren't asking me if I thought my migraines were connected to my cycles. They weren't asking me questions that were, you know, focused on 
female re reproductive diseases rather than the generalized picture of your stomach hurts. We're going to look inside of your GI and your stomach and do colonoscopies and endoscopies when you're 15 years old. Like 15 year olds usually don't need that. And then they come back clean and they're like, hmm, nothing's wrong. Um, why not look somewhere else? And so it honestly took seeing a pain management doctor and going through a series of different I guess, modalities of healing and doing acupuncture, doing acupuncture and meditation, doing acupuncture and um, specific like therapy for pain management, doing physical therapy. And then after that, doing cortisone injections, doing medication, um, literally trying all these different combinations of things. And by the end, we reached like the third level of trying different things. And she said, you know what, I think this is something you probably don't want to hear, but you should get a diagnostic laparoscopy to see if you have endometriosis. Um, a year and a half later, I decided to do the surgery because also part of me was like, what if I don't have it? One in 10 women have it. There's a 90% chance I don't have it. And there's a 10% chance I do. So it, I didn't want to do surgery, but thank God I did because I, I'm a lot better. And the other thing I will mention, which I think is kind of crazy is doctors prescribe, especially like sometimes even pediatricians or dermatologists will prescribe young women with acne, birth control pills, and they'll do that at a young age without the child essentially going to see a gynecologist first. But had the child gone to see a gynecologist, maybe they would have realized I have cyclical pain. I have migraines relating to my periods. And then that doctor could have said, oh, you might have endometriosis. So wow. I think maybe it's it's a mindset. And if I were to go back in time, I'm not saying parents need to take their daughter to a gynecologist okay. like right away when they, you know, get their period. But I do think that there's something weird happening where the education for the patient is not there. It's not, you, your doctors aren't saying, look at what your body is doing throughout your cycle so that you can see and monitor your pain. Um, they're just saying, well, you have a period, you get cramps, deal with it, go cry, eat some chocolate. And unfortunately, people are suffering in silence and it usually takes on average, I think 13 years to diagnose endometriosis. Wow. That's, yeah. that's just way too long. And it's so funny because recently I was speaking to a dear friend of mine and, and she has multiple children that have an autoimmune disease. Uh -huh. And I, I, I'm a Gen Xer, you're Gen Z. So as a Gen Xer, yeah. autoimmune disease spells out age. So as a right. Gen Xer, when I think autoimmune, that was age as a kid. Like right. the idea of all these other of autoimmune diseases that we currently know about, Back then, you never heard about it. We had we had the flu, right. we had a cold, <laughs> we, we had bronchitis. We didn't have all these other diseases that were relatively known. Um, and I was, and, and I hate to get into like a conspiracy kind of yeah. rabbit hole, but like, are we doing something different? Do you think? And again, this is all opinion. I'm not talking about unless you have studies for it. But is there something different in terms of like what we're eating, our environment that's just changed the like the molecules in in our in these humans now that are experiencing these autoimmune diseases where they weren't 20, 30, even 10 years ago? So I'm not like a food scientist or, you know, a clinical researcher or a medical doctor in any way to anyone listening. Yeah. But my personal belief is it revolves around the food we're eating. And I strongly believe that. I, I do think it also has to do a lot with socioeconomics. We know that when you're a lower class person and you're living in a neighborhood where you can get a Big Mac meal for your whole family for $20 versus, you know, somebody else spending $20 could be buying, you know, 12 bottles of Mountain Valley water. Um, and just the water is the $20 part of dinner. Right. So I do think it has to do a lot with the lack of education around what processed food really does. And also the 
kind of like that saying ignorance is bliss where people are just like i'm just gonna eat the doritos even though i know that it has red dye number one or whatever the cancerous red dye is in it and people are just saying it's not gonna hurt me it's fine and we don't know that it's not going to or maybe we do because it says that it's a carcinogenic dye so i do really think that Uh, The processed food thing is a huge problem. Another disease that I mentioned is actually called the Lone Star Tick Allergy. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was in the news um, around October. It's this tick allergy that it's a tick-borne illness, but it's not Lyme disease. And it essentially makes changes your blood uh, chemistry from the bites and the ticks that lead your body to have anaphylactic-like reactions to meat. Um, from hooved animals. And it turns out that I also have that. So I actually have been vegan and gluten free for the past year and a half. And I have seen tremendous changes in my skin, in how fast my nails grow, in my digestion, in my lack of acid reflux and stomach problems. So it's honestly like firsthand, I can say eating on this whole foods, not processed uh, diet is very challenging, but very, very rewarding because I have a mindset now where I know that avoiding certain foods is going to make me feel better. Wow. It's crazy. You know, yeah, again, none of us are scientists here, but I feel like we're, we're all, we all have lived experiences and we, we can all see like something's, yeah. something's hinky or something's something not right. Um, yeah. and, and it was funny too, because I know, a friend of mine, his dad is celiac, but he's elderly now. He's probably in his seventies, mm-hmm. and yeah. he and he lived his whole life and didn't get diagnosed with it well into middle 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 life, middle yeah. uh, middle his middle what do you call it middle age, and yeah. now he carries bread around to him at restaurants because he doesn't want to use a bread uh, bread yeah. at the restaurant. Like he has options, but I can't even imagine people you know ten years ago who were suffering with a lot of these these food allergies or 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 diseases that are around yeah. food related man how hard it is but like you mentioned there are alternatives there's a lot of more knowledge out there and also a lot of shit out there on the internet you can find but the fact that you have th- th- these assets readily available to you to to learn more about veganism uh, gluten-free diets yeah. and the fact that you can actually find a lot of these items in stores yeah. must be a huge game changer as opposed to you know just a few years ago we don't even have to go that far back yeah. It really is. And I will say the one thing that helped me because when people hear, I also don't drink. I also really like, I don't drink alcohol. I don't drink carbonated beverages and I don't drink caffeine. So I, people are like, well, what, what, what are you eating? Like, what are you living off of? And really it's like with every meal, I'm having some form of vegan protein, whether that is like a protein shake with some fruits and veggies in a smoothie, or if that is some tofu or some other (laughs) plant-based, whatever, (laughs) a plant-based semi-processed food is the best way I can say it. Um, I, I do that. And then I have some kind of carb, potatoes, rice, bread, (laughs) gluten-free bread, (laughs) something like that. And then I will have vegetables. And that's really no different than what your average person would eat. The only difference is what protein I'm eating. And people just really have a lot of opinions about the kinds of protein. Um, I don't really, it doesn't bother me at this point anymore. I think whatever works for, you know, whatever person wants that's that's their business but for me i just know that it really came with this mindset shift of like i now know that if i were to go out and eat a caprese salad that i would get so sick and it wasn't necessarily the fact that it was dairy it was the fact that it was like uh, from a hooved animal and wow. i also think in terms of the meat and the dairy thing And I don't know about the studies on this, but it's just something I'm thinking about. The antibiotics that they're putting into these animals is also something causing issues with everyone having autoimmune issues because, I mean, think about what antibiotics do Um, and think about all of a sudden how people have autoimmune diseases. It's I don't think it's too hard to put two and two together, but like I said, I'm, I'm not a scientist and if I can avoid any animal product i you know i i really 
do. And the only exception I'll make is like the summer I went to France and I was like, I can't not try a French croissant. So <laughs> I had one and unfortunately I had like a little bit of itchy skin and a reaction, but like I knew that I knew that was my decision. And so was it uh, worth yeah. it? Was it worth the itchy skin and the maybe a little, but like <laughs> I wouldn't do it often. <laughs> it was right. just I it, the other thing I will say is I love food. Like it's not like I'm like shaming people for eating how they eat or even I have friends that like all they want to do is go out and drink and live their 20s up and and enjoy going out. But that's just not my lifestyle. I'm probably not your average 25 year old. I'm in bed by nine or nine 30 every night and I wake up early with my dogs. So it's just a totally different lifestyle and mindset shift. But I think I have the most personal growth and I feel the best when I do get myself in this right state of mind. Okay. And speaking of mindset, how do you separate the illness to your humanness? And the reason I bring this up is my uncle is diabetic. Although when I say my uncle, hey, hey, you're a diabetic. He goes, no, I'm not a diabetic. I have diabetes. So oh, he yeah. he separated, like he doesn't want to be identified by his, yeah. by, his, by his disease. And I know that part of your activism and, and the work you do and the book you wrote is about the, a lot of the afflictions that you've, you've been dealt with. But how are you able to separate the two? Or, or are you not? Or do you feel like it's so intertwined with who you are, with how you live, that it's hard to separate it, or can you? Amazing question. Um, I love this question, and I love that you're asking it. So if you were to ask me this question maybe before my endometriosis and tick allergy, if I was still in a state of mind where I was suffering, I would say I don't believe that it's possible to separate the two. But in the past almost year and a half that I've kind of gotten my life back where like, just for context, I was living in 20%. 20% of the time, I would say I was able to function and like do things normally. The other 80%, I was fatigued. I would have to take naps. I would get migraines every week. Um, I couldn't exercise. I actually did not understand why people liked exercising because every time I would do it, I would get so fatigued, I would need to nap for like the rest of the day after I would exercise. And so living like that for over a decade to suddenly being able to like go on eight mile hikes uphill in Costa Rica without a problem within six months of my surgery was a huge shift for me. And it was like, wow, this thing controlled my life for so long. I'm so grateful that I now have this body that is able to like let me do the things that I haven't been able to physically do without pain or without fatigue. Um, and so I really actually have gratitude for my illness. I, I thank my body for like carrying me through it. And I thank I mean, the disease, endometriosis is a horrible disease. So by no means am I like, yes, I'm grateful for it. But I, I do think I'm grateful, maybe I'm revising my statement, for my body's ability and resilience to carry me through this mm -hmm. in terms of like networking events and the activism portion of it. You know, I think that really comes from wanting to inspire other people to be able to achieve their dreams, dreams despite any adversity that they may have, whether they have, um, you know, EDS or endo or another chronic illness or autoimmune disease. I believe that once somebody who you physically know or know of or personally know of is doing something you see yourself doing, it almost makes that dream that you have more realistic. It makes it so that you can like push a little bit harder because it feels within reach. And so that was really how I used my disease to fuel my passion and my inspiration to help others. And it really comes from, like I said, wanting to help and inspire others. Um, 
And then, I mean, other parts of it, I would say, like, when I was in Sports Illustrated, I was the first, you know, chronically ill woman to talk about my chronic illness that posed in the magazine. That was, like, great and all. But I do so much more than that. And I have so many other interests. Um, Like I mentioned, I was an art student growing up uh, in high school. And then I did art in college. I love to read. I love to rock climb um, outside. I love swimming. You know, I love cooking. And those are sides of me that the internet does not see because I do like to keep my personal interests at home. I see my social media presence as a business, not as, uh, I guess, like a place where I can happy post and make it a scrapbook. But like I said, there are still elements of my illness that I'm using just to raise awareness, I think, about what's going on. And how do you unplug from that because it's so intertwined in your personal and professional life? Because I remember when I worked in radio, I used to do a four-hour live morning show five days a week, and I would get home and my wife be like, why are you so quiet? I'm like, I'm tired of talking all day. (laughs) Like, I, you know, so I just need a break. Um, So how do you unplug from it? Is it just like you said, like going on walks, doing things that take you outside of it? Absolutely. I think also utilizing any kind of screen blocking app, like screen time block apps are so helpful. I block my apps from 8.30 p.m. to 8.30 a.m., which you know might not seem like that much time, but I do actually think it's really helpful in managing my stress level because you're realistically if i mean you could there's a lot of studies on this but like if you're looking at your screens at night it's not just the light that's affecting you it's the content that you're viewing that's spiking your cortisol before you're going to sleep so you're going to sleep stressed even if you're scrolling mindlessly about things that are like happy your mind is still going like oh what's the next meal i'm going to cook i'm going to follow this next recipe okay i'm going to save it okay like you're doing things and even if the content is not toxic or like bad in any way you're still making your mind be active when you should be preparing your mind for rest um i'm getting back into this night and nightly wind down and morning wind up routine because i fell out of it. Uh, But last year around this time, I was literally winding down from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. I was putting my red light on, starting my humidifier, going into my sauna blanket, and listening to meditation all at the same time. And I would listen to a meditation. And when I tell you, like, I don't think I ever felt so well rested um in my life like doing that wind down wind up was really amazing i just think sometimes also having two puppies under a year old is a little bit challenging to find time to rest like that so early so i'm working on getting back into it maybe i'll do it in the middle of the day now just to kind of see and and do a test but yeah i think just really self care is important and not just like the face mask kind of self-care, but really like what's something that you can do every day to learn? What's something that you can do every day to ground yourself? And like, I'm not asking for a lot. I'm asking for like a minute or two of gratitude practice. I'm asking for um, five minutes max of just breathing with no distraction, with your eyes closed, right? Um, Letting your mind wander or listening to some kind of yoga nidra or reading five pages of a book. Um, I think we tend to overcomplicate self-care because in today's world, I think rest is not really prioritized at all. Um, And I think when we think self-care, we think face masks, massages, spa time, spending money on things when really all we need to focus on rest is our breath and we we can just shift our mindset. So that's something that I do a lot. And also when I'm spending time with really important people in my life, like getting off my phone is really, really important, especially again, like you mentioned, because social media is my job. I'm on my phone all the time and it becomes really hard to take that rest, but I think it's essential. I mentioned uh, you're Gen Z. You're the first uh, digital native 
uh, generation. Yes. And we are recording this in April of 2024, where social media is a bit under fire, uh, whether it's in a federal government against TikTok or local governments like Florida banning social media use for, for teenagers. Um, yeah. What's your take on, on the current state of social media and children? I, I, yeah. we, we could do a whole podcast on the number of studies of how bad I'm social sure. media is, is for kids, but you're the first gen to have to deal with it uh, from the jump. What, what do you think? Do you think some of these rules are too sort of over the top? Do you think it should just be left to the parents? I mean, how, how can we guard the next generation? I think it's Gen Alpha. Like how how can we yeah. help Gen Alpha? Because I I'm sure a lot of those kids are starting to get their first phones. So, sure. you know, what's your thoughts on all that? Yeah. So a really good friend of mine um, named Larissa May has an amazing nonprofit called Half the Story, which is where I started learning from her and the work that that organization does. Is um, I, I started learning about the way that kids were basically getting addicted to technology the way that maybe people in your generation and the boomer generation um, was addicted to cigarettes and alcohol and really viewing social media as a drug, not as a tool. Um, because, and I, I will say also, I say social media is a tool because it is. It's a marketing tool that advertisers and brands use to market and or manipulate, right. dare I say, uh, customers to buy their product at a less expensive and easier to enter rate than media buys or advertising traditionally. So social media is a tool, first of all. There is no program or literacy uh, pamphlet or workshop or workbook or code of conduct for anyone engaging in social media. And so my friend and her organization go around to, I think, high schools and maybe middle schools teaching kids about productive ways to use social media rather than um, ways to not use it because realistically, if you tell a kid you're going to take away their Xbox, they're just going to go to their friend's house and try to play Xbox. They're not. There's not a world where social media is not going to exist for young children, for young people, for even people my age that are 25 scrolling at work, right? We just need to learn how to set better boundaries with it, right? Um, you don't let your kids, I mean, well, I don't know actually nowadays because there's this whole iPad generation of children um, but at least when I was growing up and again, I'm 25, so I'm like the upper echelon, upper end of uh, Gen Z. Right. And I would say that the TV wasn't always on. TV was a privilege that we got when we got home, when we got done with our homework, when our friends were over for a special occasion, or if like a show we really wanted to watch was on. So I think we need to view social media that way. For kids to realize like it's a privilege to be able to use social media and you need to maybe do the homework of understanding it a little bit before you just mindlessly consume. Um, but these apps are unfortunately designed to be addictive. Yeah. And I've fallen into the trap where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm working in social media. I'm researching. Right. I'll be research scrolling for hours. And I'm like, Gigi. No, <laughs> at yeah. some point you got to cut yourself off. Um, and I think there's other ways to do this research and to take a format and to figure out like, okay, instead of mindlessly scrolling, I like this person's format, type in that style format on YouTube, figure out how to film a video that way that fits for you rather than mindlessly scrolling, trying to get inspiration. Um, so I think, I don't know if that fully answered the question. Um, but I do think it also relies just as much on the parent in teaching kids how to engage with social media as it does on education system and offering the same way they offer sex ed, offering some kind of digital media literacy or social media literacy class. And 
also, unfortunately, in order to get something like that mandated in classrooms, especially in public schools around the country, you have to look holistically at the education system, which is already failing so many kids. So unfortunately, good luck with that happening is what I have to say about that. Well, it's funny. Uh, Jonathan Haidt is getting a lot of uh, press recently for the book he's put out about social media's effect on children. And one of the steps he takes, and I'd, like, I'd love to get your take on it. So I don't know if you want to have kids or not, or whether any of your friends want to have kids, but he suggests don't give a young kid a smartphone, give them a flip phone. You know, let them, you know, if you're worried about their safety, you want to keep tabs on them, give them a flip phone, and then wait till maybe they're 16 or, or late, or even, you know, maybe 15, 16 to give them a social media account. Um, what's your take on that? Because again, you're the first gen that's dealt with this. Now going forward, how do you want the next gen to, to handle something like this? Yeah, I think my generation definitely is really sensitive and honestly in tune with the negative effect social media has on our individual selves, on our relationships, on our friendships. I mean, think about also when you get broken up with, right? When my friends get broken up with, the first thing they do is either block the guy that they're dating or they don't block him because they want to see him watching their Instagram stories mm -hmm. and swiping up and engaging passively even though their relationship has ended just because it's a means of connection. And so I think that it kind of like falsifies the actual relationships that we have versus maybe in your generation, if you got broken up with, you probably don't have a way of talking to them um, at all. Uh, it just is that that is what it is and it sucks and goodbye and my generation does not quite understand or handle rejection well and so when i think also gen z sorry to go off track no gen z is like one of the loneliest generations too and i do think that's a direct result of social media and that's why we have problems maintaining long-term relationships um with either friends or intimate relationships um just because it can be so hard to build that trust and connection, knowing that if you break up, there's still a digital archive of your relationship together. And that can be really hard. Um, in terms of the young kids getting smartphones versus flip phones, I think that's a great idea. I, I started with a flip phone when I was in, I think, second or third grade. Uh, and I was only walking three blocks to school. But you know, my parents wanted to stay in the loop if I was going by myself. Also, New York City can be a crazy place for young children to be yeah. walking out and about on their own. So Even adults I think, right now, you might get punched in the yeah. face. That happens. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. It apparently does happen here now. So yeah. Uh, I think it's important for kids to have some form of communication with their parents. I think that's really smart and important. I also think the fact that like things like find my iPhone didn't exist back then was in a way kind of helpful because even like to this day, my mom still has my find my iPhone and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, this is annoying. But the solution to that, in my opinion, would be dropping an air tag in your your kid's lunchbox or whatever so that it's like passively there and that the kid's not really thinking of like, oh, my mom's stalking me, like even though you kind of are, but like it's like a safety thing. Um, and I think in terms of the social media accounts, like, yeah, the longer you keep a kid off of social media, probably the better. I've been on it since I was... 12 years or 10 years old, something like that. Um, like, no, maybe not 10. Whenever Facebook was started, like 20, 2011, maybe. Yeah, is when 2010, I got 2011 was Facebook, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I was like 12 or 13. Um, good luck, though. I don't know how you're going to – if if everyone is not collectively doing it, good luck because I wasn't – when I asked to get a Facebook account, my parents said no, and I made a fake email, and I made a Facebook account where I made a fake birthday that I could use because I wanted a Facebook account, and nobody was stopping me. And so, again, to that I say good luck. Kids are very clever. Now that kids also have access to things like iPads, even if they're signed in on their own, they understand how to type in things at an early age now. Like, they're doing a lot more than I think kids were before. 
But I also think something that I learned, again, from my friend Larissa is that kids will spend on average, the, the, this next generation and my generation will spend on average 30 years of our life in front of a screen collectively, which is a lot of time given that I think the average lifespan is what, like 75 now yeah, or something? 70, like yeah. it's it's relatively, it's like half your life. Yeah. Um, And I would exclude the first 20 20 years 20 to 25 years because they say your brain's not even fully developed so you know 75 minus 25 is 50 minus 30 you have 20 years of your life to live without a screen that's horrible it's absolutely horrible um another thing that i i've learned over the years is that i think kids are getting what's called digital dementia because they're not using their critical thinking skills anymore. They're all focused on getting an answer instantly instead of using their memory. And that to me is the most scary of this whole thing. And I think if we are educating teachers about this more, if we're educating kids more at a young age about, again, how to use technology as a tool rather than like a privilege or like candy, um, maybe that will change our overall relationship with it and make it so that the next generation is a little bit more aware and safe online. Awesome. Uh, All right. So let's uh, wrap this up by circling back to what we started talking about, chronic illness. Uh, You wrote a book, a kid's book about chronic illness. Um, So give me an elevator pitch. Who's this for? So this book is for anyone, really. It says it's for, I think, age five to 65 or five plus. And I really mean it that way. It's a very simplified version of what I would have liked to read when I was a teenager, even just to understand, like, sometimes teachers won't understand, friends won't understand, maybe even, I mean, I was fortunate enough that my family really did understand and treat me so well, but a lot of people's families don't understand when the child is dealing with a chronic illness and they just think they're lazy or like don't want to go to school. And that doesn't really feel good when you're literally like, no, like I am struggling so much right now. And so this book is for anyone struggling with a chronic illness. Um, It does detail my specific journey with Ehlers-Danlos, but I do believe that that story, unfortunately, can be applied to almost anyone dealing with a chronic illness or autoimmune disease. And yeah, it's, it's for parents just as much as it is for kids. I think a parent reading this book can take a step back and realize, wow, like I didn't realize things could feel like this for my child, whereas the child might just feel seen and validated. So that is who it's for. Awesome. Uh, lastly, a tip. Give me one for a kid who's who's just found out that they've been diagnosed with a chronic illness, five to 15, whatever age you wanna fill in. What, what would be the first piece of advice you would give to that one person uh, knowing that whatever they've just been told by some strange, scary adult that's going to change the way the, the rest of their life is going to play out. What, what do you give? What, what would you say to that person? I would say knowledge is power. So, yes, it's going to be scary that you have this thing that might affect your life or how you'll have kids or relationships down the line. But knowing yourself and knowing that this condition has affected you a certain way and will continue to affect you a certain way will help you navigate the world much better and put up boundaries and advocate for yourself. So knowledge is power. All right. And on that, there's a lot of knowledge, quote unquote, knowledge out there. How do you prevent someone going down that proverbial rabbit hole that I mentioned earlier? Be like, oh my God, my doctor said I have this, and I'm seeing all these pages and blogs that are scaring the living shit out of me. How do you prevent that from happening? Self-control. Um, I mean, I think we're supposed to trust our doctors. I think getting two to three opinions before you commit to having the condition or before it's confirmed is really important. Uh, just because 
you never know. Um, one person could have one philosophy, another could have another. And like I said, it took going to one right doctor after going to dozens of wrong doctors for me to figure out what was the problem. And um, I would just say, yeah, like do your research, but don't look too much into the side effects because typically when it, they have to tell you the side effects legally, but usually the side effects are like less than 2% of people get side effects from these medications or procedures. And so yes, can horrible things happen? Absolutely. But does that mean they will? Not necessarily. Awesome. Her name is Gigi Robinson. Gigi, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to reach out, shoot me an email at JoePartavilla at ProtonMail.com. And lastly, it would be awesome if you could leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave a big old thumbs up. Thanks for checking us out. Until next time, adios.